Over the last year, the nation has faced some of the most critical challenges of our time. From the coronavirus pandemic to social injustice, Americans have come together to raise their voices and demand change. A strive for social justice is at the forefront of national and local conversation, and it's no different here on Marquette's campus. Students, faculty, and administration have been a part of the movement to make the university a more diverse and inclusive space. We look at how the campus climate has evolved over the past year in response to these challenges and what still needs to be done. This is Being the Difference, a town hall on diversity and inclusion. Welcome to Being the Difference, a town hall on diversity and inclusion. I'm your host, Alex Rivera Grant. And I'm Andrew Muzu. This past year has been one for the history books, from a global pandemic that has taken the lives of millions to racial injustices, hate crimes, and gun violence. This year has been difficult for many not only to cope with, but to understand. Here, our goal is simple, to listen to one another and try to make a change. We will have an open and candid conversation between student leaders on campus about what our campus culture here at Marquette University looks and feels like. Later, we will hear from some faculty who have supported students along the way. We will reflect on the year and discuss how we can move forward. This conversation was not meant to just be between student leaders of multicultural organizations on campus. It was meant to be a conversation between our university's administration, including President Michael Lovell. Unfortunately, he declined to participate in the event. Yet, we know this is a conversation that needs to be heard. Take a look at what students had to say. Diversity and inclusion. One word, that's a good question. Um, this is so hard. Um, if I had one word to describe it, I think I would have described it as hidden. Improving. Amazing. What were you? Work in progress. I would say ambivalence. Dope. Improving. I would say the campus climate is homogenous. Effort. In progress. It was pretty inviting. I think I would probably describe the campus climate through just community service. Rocky. <laughs> I think it's pretty diverse. Um, there are people who look like me that pop out every now and then. Um, there are people like my friend over here, Puerto Rican, who pop out every now and then. Well, so I think it's pretty diverse. I think you got all types of cultures here. I feel like people are very welcoming. Uh, not like where I'm from. So uh, it's a good experience for me to experience something new in my life. I think for me, finding the diversity here was hard. Um, I had to like search in a, a small secluded part of Marquette. You know, it's a lot of different um, groups coming together and, you know, co-resisting together to, uh, you know, uh, make progress. And we are making progress, but it's, you know, we aren't, we aren't anywhere where we want to be. I feel like there isn't much conversation that goes, ar that goes around or much education about race and just um, how to do, like help like communities that have been suffering, you know, or like that, that have been attacked like because of racism. I think the university doesn't view in a lot of cases, especially the queer community, as an asset to the campus climate. They kind of view it as a community that they have to accommodate, but they're not necessarily proud of. Part of me, because I am very involved with diversity and inclusion office, that's the aspect where I'm like, I see all of the inclusion there. Um, but outside of it, in terms of the rest of campus, I feel like there could be more education towards diversity and inclusion. We are joined by some student leaders on Marquette's campus to talk more about our campus culture. Please join me in welcoming Black Student Council President Brianna Flowers, Native American Student Association President Alex Liberato, Latin American Student Organization President Stephanie Salas, and Vice President Naxeli Sanchez, Bahanian Student Organization President Michelle Batad, former Marquette University Student Government President Evelia Guerrero, co-founder of Marquette Bangra Academy Kirikar, and Gender Sexual Alliance Treasurer Danielle Del Conte. Thank you all so much for being here and let's get started. So my first question is, what has been your organization's experience on campus? And Alex, we're gonna start with you. Yeah, my organization's experience here on campus. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, kind of taking that a bit broadly, um, you know, we've been here for, you know, 
a great many years. Um, you know, I came in my sophomore year, so about three years ago or so. Um, and, you know, we've always had a very small but uh, mighty community here on campus. You know, we have like less than 50 native students here on campus or 60 native students. So, you know, out of 10,000, you know, do the math. Um, you know, it's it's kind of it, it's kind of hard to build off of that. But, um, you know, we've been able to kind of build a community, you know, not just, you know, of Native American students, but staff mm -hmm. member faculty members and, you know, a community of our multicultural students as well. Everybody on this call, um, a lot of people and a lot of their organizations I've, or I've organized with and interacted with. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. So um, our organization has been here for a minute now. I think it's about 10, 15 years. Um, we also just got approved to have the Black Student Union on campus. So we'll be having two different orgs, one more for the social advocacy side, and then one more for events and programming, things like that. But our experience has been, you know, pretty much the same as everyone else, trying to kind of pave our own way for ourselves and create community together. Like, you know, Alex said, these are my friends, you know, I seen Evelia, I got really happy, Naxebi, you know, Alex and everyone else. We've been, I feel like all of our experiences have been kind of the same, just kind of paving a, a different path and creating more opportunities for for people within our orgs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. We're actually going to move on to our next question. So how difficult is it running an ethnic organization at a predominantly white institution like Marquette? And we're going to begin with you, Michelle. Um, obviously, I, I would like to see more um, acknowledgement from Ad Marquette administration uh, by any hand student organization was established in 1988. So we have been here for quite a while um, and our community continues to grow. We continue to celebrate our culture through our fashion show and cultural shows. Um, but with our very small community and the large scale of um, more like white students, I would like to see like just the administration like celebrating um, our MSC orgs more um, and just like validating us as well. Um, so our team, MUBA, it's a dance team and it's actually been around only for two years. So we are very, very new. We established it because we didn't see the diversity that we wanted. So we had to create it. Um, and so it has been very challenging because we are so new um, to create our platform on campus and to educate people about who we are, what we stand for, um, and to just show our culture. Um, obviously, dance teams do attract a lot of attention and you do get the hype. Um, so we have got a lot of traction from people, but due to COVID and everything, it has been really hard um, managing that. But um, like Michelle said, the support from administration would be great for so many organizations because they would be validating our presence on campus and making us feel way more powerful than we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that a lot of orgs do feel that way as well. And kind of going off of administration, we actually asked President Lovell to be a part of this conversation. He declined that invitation. So what is your response to that? Do you feel support from Marquette's administration? And we'll start with you, Stephanie. Um, personally, I feel like depending on different faculty members, I've had a lot of support. Um, such as like from my own major, they're like, oh, thank you for doing this, or from our advisor, Jackie Black, shout out to her. She's really with us in this whole organization stuff. And just like a different bunch of faculty, but as from the higher ups, I haven't really heard from them. I don't even know if they know we exist, like all of our organizations, they might know that there's something out there, but they don't know exactly who and who, and they put it together. Um, but I know I saw President Level like supporting Evelia and Elizabeth. Congrats to you guys. Um, and I think that was pretty big, just them, him just acknowledging that they existed and were first gen students, Latina students here at Marquette. Sure. So I think student government has a unique um, relationship with administration where because of who we are, because of, of the title or whatever it may be, um, we meet with administration on a much more regular 
um, basis. So in, in terms of like physical being there for the meeting support, that has been there for me um, and Elizabeth. Um, but in terms of being able to transfer that over to, hey, let's listen to ethnic orgs on campus. Let's bring other students to the table. That's definitely been a lot more difficult to navigate and a lot more difficult to bring to the table. Um, and so that was one of our major focuses to this year with Elizabeth is to bring more students of color, organizations of color um, to the table and not just have it be student government there. Um, I think um, Alex probably has the same experience. You have to kind of go in their faces to try to get a response or, you know, try to really reach out to them um, unless they want to talk to you about something else, you know, unless they want to put you at a table uh, to take a picture or something and you kind of have to go seek support yourself, uh, which has been one of the things that, you know, I know I've personally been dealing with. But right now we're in a situation right where we're trying to work together. Um, to create change, you know, um, a lot of the work is on the students, of course, and they have to approve it. But um, our relationship with the administration right now is it's been, I don't know, it's a working relationship. I'll say that um, we're we're working and they're trying to, you know, do more things for for students, Black students on campus, and mainly in the city is what we were trying to fight for as well, because the city of Milwaukee is predominantly Black, and we have to make sure that we're not hoarding resources and giving back to the community that Marquette is in. I think the administration is doing more understanding. I feel like they're in a process right now where they have to relearn everything they were taught because it wasn't correct. And um, I think that um, like from a student perspective, it is tiring at times to have to teach adults and teach people who is being paid to do their paid to do a job and you're not getting anything from it. <laughs> you're not getting no money, you're getting stressed and headaches. But in the end, you know, it's, it's going to be worth it. And I, and I know I'll say that I know I know Alex for the same way because I've been in his meetings and I know that pain and he knows our pain. That's why I'm speaking for Alex and speaking with Alex, you know, because we've had some similar experiences. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And it's kind of, you know, um, interesting. You know, I, I was just talking with uh, myself and Bree's mutual friend, uh, Sir Lawrence, you know, the administration deals with Native American students deals with black students, deals with, you know, different students and kind of like, it's kind of a divide and conquer type situation. I feel like it's easier for them to learn in small, um, you know, small increments. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a bit harder for them to uh, budge, you know, when you have a united student body um, and united uh, ethnic cultural organizations working together. So that's why, you know, we've been over the past year, we've been trying to really coordinate a lot of the actions and like be in each other's meetings and, uh, you know, co-resistance. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for sharing all that. It really is super important to talk about relationships with administration. And this was brought up earlier, but we kind of want to switch over to faculty members. Are there faculty members on campus that you can look to for help and support? And we're going to start with you, Danielle. What are your thoughts? Um, I mean, speaking for the LGBT community, um, the faculty that identify as queer on Marquette's campus, there's very few in numbers and a lot of them that we have heard from have said that they really have a tough time deciding whether it's safe to be out on this campus, that they feel they could potentially be denied tenureship or denied a renewal of their contract if they do come out and share. So I think that the limited um, faculty that we have. And I mean, Marquette has that across the board with all sorts of ethnic and racial and sexual minorities that um, the students and the changing demographics of the students just don't reflect um, in the faculty who are teaching the classes that the students are attending. So I think Marquette should definitely look into diversifying um, who they're hiring. I have to agree a lot with Danielle in that aspect that there's only so many faculty members that we could reach out to. Like I know personally, like Steph said, Jackie Black, she's amazing. We can always rely on her. And then Dr. Gonzalez, he's one of the only other Latinx professors that is out there and actually willing to listen to our issues. Apart from that, there's uh, hardly any, they could all fit on my hands. Like, and the thing is that that doesn't, again, doesn't show who Marquette is in terms of student wise. We need we, we do need to diversify the faculty. That's that should be one of the main concerns of the university, Damien. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know what, like Natalie said, there's there's such few faculty that I can think of them just just on my hand, right, on my couple of fingers. Um, and then some of the faculty that do come to mind aren't professors of color, aren't staff of color. Um, just me personally, Jackie Black has been one of my biggest allies, just being able to bounce ideas off of her about MUSG, about the university, about Marquette, with students, about students, about implicit bias. Um, and then something else that's pretty personal too is um, being able to kind of be and have a relationship with my Dean of the College of Nursing, Dean Janet Krachke, and just being able to bounce ideas off of her as well and talk about the issues that we as nurses of color face in the College of Nursing and being able to push her to, um, to take you know, the College of Nursing towards a success of equity and diversity and having more nurses of color. So it's really hard to come up with some of the names because it's so few and the names that we kind of throw here are, are pretty much the same ones and that we all get to know. Yeah, well, thank you so much for sharing this. So our next question, we actually wanna hear from everyone, um, but the university has moved forward in offering more scholarships to people of color, adding a mural representing women in leadership and it has made progress in becoming a Hispanic serving community. So is this what project, progress looks like to you? What does the ideal campus look like? And Stephanie, we're gonna start with you. So I saw this in an email, but I couldn't like find the links to, like, to read all of it because I know HSI has been like on our, on our like agenda for a long time now. But I think any like progress, even a step towards the right direction is progress. Obviously, it's not going to get to how we all want it to be, how we're like happy, unified, and getting along yet, but we have, Marquette has so much potential to get there. Um, I definitely feel like we have made progress, but not enough. Um, like Bree was saying earlier, it's sad that the students are doing the bulk of the work and the faculty have to do the unlearning and relearning they're the ones who should be responsible and, you know, we're kind of the pieces to the puzzle to help them. But um, just a lot goes into it, like more scholarships for students of color, more faculty of color, more um, counselors of color, more resources and spaces for students of color to feel safe and welcomed and to collaborate with one another. Um, I mean, obviously there's stuff done, but I do feel like we could be doing a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think anything moving forward is a step in progress. I think it's amazing. I think it's great. That being said, there is so much more work that needs to be done and will be done hopefully in the futures. I know um, because I'm also president of a multicultural sorority on campus, I know how much diversity is really important to us. One of our pillars is increasing multicultural awareness and Marquette has it, it just doesn't like to showcase it as often. Um, and so I think doing these small steps will help amplify those small voices that are kind of get that get hidden. Um, so I think anything is better than what we currently have. If Marquette um, administration does have the willpower to make living learning communities for the black community on campus and if they are willing to kind of go with what these students are saying in the um, POC community, then we're kind of hoping that the same thing can also translate um, intersectionally into the queer spaces too and that potentially we could be leapfrogging off of some of the strides that are being made in those other spaces. Um, but I definitely think for the queer community, a lot of work is need to be done. And a lot of our conversations with the administration have been shut down, just saying that um, especially the trustees just won't fund anything if they perceive it being supportive of the LGBT community. So I definitely say in that space, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done and that the administration thus far doesn't seem that interested in investing in that. Yeah, first of all, you know, shout out to Bree and BSC getting 40 scholarships for black students, you know, shout out, you know, we're getting Marquette towards becoming an HSI, we're working to change the seal, but, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, the work that was put in, you know, on the front end to getting this taken care of, you know, between organizing protests and all the work that needs to be done, you know, calling around, you know, putting all of this together in order to 
build real momentum for change. Um, I think the real, I, I mean, this is progress, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And I don't think that all this student, all this work needs to fall on the students. Um, you know, we've had to put in a lot of the work. I think it should, I think it should start transferring over to, you know, um, the administrative side. Sorry, yeah, um, I agree with everyone said. I think Angela Davis has said it in like a conference I was at or something. She was like, revolutionary time is always ahead of the spectrum. So people are thinking like we're making revolutionary moves and I'll say that even for us, like the 42 scholarships or whatever, that should have happened 25 years ago. You know what I mean? Um, when we were in the meeting actually signing for, you know, the the demands or the agreements to be met, Dr. Lovell uh, said that this is the most revolutionary thing we've done since EOP. And that was 50 years ago. So it's just like we're moving very, very, very slow. And it's um, it, it hurts the youth. It hurts the youth. It hurts us. We shouldn't be in this space right now. We should be 10 steps ahead, but, you know, we're having the same conversations that, you know, our elders had literally like Alex, what the elders are having, your elders are having this conversation. So, you know, it's like frustrating to a certain extent, but I, I don't believe that, you know, one step is progress. I think 10 steps is progress because we're behind. So we got to really, 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 really put like the foot to the pedal and, you know, make the university understand that you're behind and you're lacking resources and it's hurting and it's really like hurting the mental health, the educational, you know, welfare and the physical welfare of your students, because here we are, you know, having a discussion on, you know, um, what Marquette can do to help our community at 655 when we could be doing homework. Other students aren't doing that. So it's like um, these conversations, yes, they need to be had, but the university really needs to just step it up and stop listening and start, you know, doing things on their own sometimes. Again, I have to agree with everyone on here, but we also have to recognize that Yes, they built, um, they made a mural. Um, yes, they made these 40 scholarships, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's them barely doing the bare minimum. We have to continue pushing for more because there's so many students on this campus. Um, I've been one of them that haven't felt welcomed. I was at the brink of actually switching to a whole other university in a whole different other state because of that feeling. And I was living in a learn in a living learning community. Um, even though I was though, when I was on campus in my classes, I would be the only one from a mixed status family. I would be the only one talking about immigration. Professors would be using dehumanizing language in all different aspects. And that's just tiring. And professors don't understand, don't understand that students don't understand that, especially, um, white students on this campus, they don't have to be working two jobs to be able to afford tuition. They don't have to be worrying about their family if they're gonna be deported or arrested by the police. That That's just worries that we carry as students of color and mi minorities on this campus. And it gets tiring. Um, and to get personal too, I've been talking to a counselor on this. It gets mentally draining at so many levels. And that's just on this campus. That doesn't include the work I do like through my community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm gonna reiterate a ton of things that were just said, but you know, from I, I think I have seen progress in my time here, but the progress is slow and the progress can seem really superficial at times. Um, from the student government perspective, I'm the first Latina in this role and only the ninth female to be president of, of this organization. And we've been around for over a hundred years. I mean, what is that? Why, why did it take so long and why aren't there more students running? Um, and, and so what I think I would like to see um, from the university moving forward is, is for our white counterparts on this campus to also be educated, to be educated by our professors, by our university, not by us as students of color, not by us and all of our intersecting identities. I shouldn't have to do that. Bree shouldn't have to do that. Naxeli shouldn't have to do that. Alex shouldn't have to do that. None of us should have to do that. Um, that should be integrated into the curriculum and should be something that they do within their classes or on their own time. Um, you know, at 6.55 on a Zoom call on, on a Monday. Um, something else too that we talked about is, is top, 
top to bottom action, not bottom up. Um, students are doing the book of the work, like we've said. And, you know, like Naxali said too, I've, I've also had to seek out counseling because the, the pressure of being president, the pressure of being Latina, a female on campus, of worrying about my parents' immigration status is crushing. Um, and I can only imagine that that's the case for a lot more students on this campus. And so at the end of the day, we are students on this campus that came to learn, came to get an education. Um, and we've been forced to be social justice warriors, social justice advocates. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, I think I can speak for all of us when we say that sometimes that role of social advocacy has come before being a student. Uh, you know, all the times I haven't written a paper or put off studying to get all my other responsibilities done, the work should be coming from the top to the bottom, not us having to do the bulk of the work. And I think that's one of the biggest things that affects us um, as, as student leaders on this campus. Yeah, I definitely agree. It shouldn't just be your responsibility to take care of all these issues on campus. Well, I wanna thank you all so much for joining us. I really appreciated all your words and your time. Thank you so much. On the third floor of Coughlin Hall, Dante McFadden, the Senior Associate Director for the Educational Opportunity Program, shares a typical day in his life. Both doing all right? His schedule includes planning, meeting, doing and good, even talking good. with students. A typical day is um, just um, setting out um, an agenda for w what I need to do uh, throughout the day, whether it's um, meeting students or contacting students right. or taking part go. in meetings, um, whether in person or virtually. And then uh, from that point, um, oh, right. um, I would say about a couple times a week, I meet with the McNair staff uh, just to talk about some things we need to do in terms of working with students. Along with setting an agenda for each day, McFadden also has his eyes set on what lies ahead. We also are talking about um, what are some other programs, other McNair programs that we can collaborate with regionally. McFadden says he's begun the initial steps toward planning for the fall. My job is to build upon what they discuss initially in the summer right, and um, talk about it more extensively they, in the uh, fall. What's the best way to go about being outspoken about social justice issues um, that matter to them? Marquette's McNair program has allowed students to make impactful relationships. These relationships that they build with each other, um, being a McNair, will likely continue um, beyond completing their bachelor's degree. The biggest challenge for the Educational Opportunity Program is garnering enough funding. You know, with universities, especially um, during this time that we're in right, right now, is um, trying to uh, make sure that we have enough money to provide the best kind of experience it, it, as possible for students. Hey, yo, Nigel, talking to your appreciation oh, for participating. Appreciate it. And now we'll hear more from faculty who have made a difference on campus and in students' lives. Please join me in welcoming Director of the Office of Engagement and Inclusion, Demetria Bell Anderson, Associate Director of Hispanic Initiatives, Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion, Jackie Black, and Senior Associate Director of Undergraduate Research and High Impact Practices in the Educational Opportunities Program, Dr. McFadden. Thank you all for being here. Now let's just get started. We've heard from students about how they work with you and the impact that you've made in their lives. And we want to know how you work with students on a day-to-day -day basis. Jackie, we'll start with you. So a lot of my work actually um, occurs behind the scenes. Our office, our Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion uh, works on strategic initiatives um, that help make Marquette a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive space. So we do work a lot behind the scenes with staff, with faculty, with administrators, but we do some work with students. Um, in particular, um, one of my roles is as the staff advisor for our Latin American student organization. Um, so that's one way where I've continued to engage with students on campus. Yeah, sure. So with the Office of Engagement and Inclusion, I like to say that we do just about everything outside of the classroom uh, with the exclusion of our residence halls. Um, so primarily our work is with our LGBTQ plus student population, um, obviously over the more than 300 student organizations on campus, um, our sorority and fraternity life community, students working with 
their own leadership interests um, or looking to gain more in, uh, insight about their leadership interests, as well as um, our, uh, shoot, I just lost it, as well as our um, um, campus activities and late night programs, mm -hmm. so all of those things. Um, members of my team and I, along with other colleagues on campus, advise our student government. So there's an awesome opportunity to get to know students there. I've always approached my work um, with the understanding that every student is like every other student, some other student, and no other student. Mm -hmm. So always really looking to meet students where they are, um, and we can hopefully help them become the people that they will be uh, individuals serving for and with others. Thank you. So. I oversee four initiatives within EOP. I'm the director of the McNair Scholars Program. I'm also the facilitator for the first year seminar. I am also in charge of organizing the lunch and learn sessions. And I'm also responsible for organizing the Sandy Robinson Emerging Leaders Program. Mm -hmm. And so mainly the capacities in which um, I interact with students um, Currently, um, as a uh, teacher, um, I'm uh, currently um, overseeing the uh, McNair Undergraduate Research Seminar, where students are taking uh, baby steps towards um, designing the research projects that they will carry out over an eight-week summer period. Okay. Um, I also advise students uh, with regards to their research, with regards to their academics, and then also with um, how to go about um, deciding the graduates programs they want to pursue, whether master's or doctoral programs, and then also advise them in um, seeking funding uh, to support their graduate studies. Um, I'm also um, the facilitator within the first year seminar. So sometimes um, I am giving presentations on a, a variety of different topics, uh, particularly note taking and critical thinking. And I'm also sometimes the moderator for the EOP lunch and learn sessions and um, making sure that students have an opportunity to meet other students, faculty and staff on campus and what their specialties are, as well as people from outside the Marquette campus and in uh, large capacities in the Milwaukee community as well. So I um, have um, the, so I have I come from the standpoint of, um, you know, overseeing things from I guess you could say a 10,000 uh, foot point of view, but also having that one-on-one -on -one communication with students as well. You guys definitely cover a lot of ground. Uh, but for now, let's take it back. Let's reflect back to your time as a student. What was it like going to college as a student of color in your time? What similarities do you see with today's students, if any at all? Demetria, we'll go to you first. Oh, wow, that was so long ago. Um, <laughs> well, I'll share, I am a first generation college student um, and I, I come from a single parent family. Um, there's a nine and 15 year age difference between me and my siblings. Wow. So getting to school, I remember I literally got dropped off with $40 to pay for books and tuition, right? We didn't know anything about the FAFSA, had no clue about how a lot of those things work. Um, and I actually went to college about eight hours away from home. So even that adjustment in that period and what that looked like for me, um, those first six to nine weeks of the semester, I called home and I was like, hey, my mom needs me to come help with my sisters. I'm gonna be done with this, I'm not gonna finish. And when I talked to my mom, she said, well, no, that's where you're supposed to be. That's where you're gonna stay, right? Um, when I think about today's college students and also being a, a parent now of a college freshman um, this year, and knowing that this year has been a very interesting year altogether, um, I, I definitely like to draw from personal experience of being able to remember what my time was like as a college student, especially being first gen, um, and now also as a parent of a college student, what that um, what that looks like, right, for parents. But I like to take a look at the student experience from a holistic perspective, um, drawing on my own experiences, but then also, like I said, being a parent of a college student. The similarities that I see, again, this is a very um, interesting time for a young person to be going away from home, even if it's just down the street around the corner, you are still very much becoming your own person and knowing what that feels like, um, especially in the case of our first gen students where they don't necessarily have anyone who's already gone through this process before, but then also as a parent, 
I understand what it means to call home sometimes, you know, just to check in. Um, so I feel like I'm able to relate on a couple of different levels to the students as well as the families. Um, I think some of the similarities still, um, challenging time, uh, scary time, but it's a very exciting time and mm-hmm. looking for folks who will be able to kind of help you harness that for yourself as well. Um, so that's how I try to connect with our students to make sure that they know I've been there. Um, I have someone who's going through that too. And I can also be a resource to kind of help you navigate um, and never be afraid to ask a question. You know, what's unique about my experience is that um, I went to um, a private school from sixth grade until I graduated high school, university school in Milwaukee. And that was my first experience in, um, you know, being, uh, you know, one of the few people of color, in some cases, uh, the only black person in the classroom. And so when I got to college at UW-Milwaukee and I was in that situation, it wasn't um, so overwhelming because, um, you know, I'd already been through that. Um, However, um, you know, there were, um, you know, there were some struggles with regards to, you know, just always trying to make sure that uh, my schooling was paid for uh, with regards to tuition to also make sure that uh, books were paid for. Um, I was a film production student um, as an undergraduate. um, So that uh, that meant I had to pay for supplies, uh, you know, to make projects and things like that. And then I also went through um, Upward Bound at Marquette. So that experience gave me um, the ability to navigate a college campus uh, when we would spend summers there. But um, I was also a commuter student at UW-Milwaukee. So, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, traveling from the east side of Milwaukee all the way to where I was living at home. Uh, with, with my mother um, on the north side, on the northwest side of Milwaukee. We're talking um, like Timmerman Field or, you know, what used to be called Northridge Lakes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, you know, catching, um, you know, two buses to school um, mm-hmm. each way. And then and on top of that, um, you know, you know, going to work as well, um, you know, working whatever part-time job I had. And what I noticed with, you um, you know, students now, um, you know, some are experiencing that themselves, um, you know, within EOP, um, and we have a significant amount of students who are commuter students and who are also um, balancing, balancing a full-time uh, course load um, in addition to uh, working, in addition to uh, family obligations and things like that. So, um, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, so the same experiences that I went through back in the mid, excuse me, uh, mid to late 90s, um, you know, I see students, um, you know, still going through um, in 2021. Yeah, and even though there's been so many years since then, still a lot of similarities. And for this, we asked uh, President Lovell to be part of this conversation, but he declined. Uh, What is your response to that? Do you feel support from Marquette's administration for students of color? Demetria, your thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, I think absolutely. So for example, the history of the Office of Engagement and Inclusion, we were actually established in August of 2019. And what our Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Xavier Cole decided to do was to um, kind of marry together the, uh, what you would think of as typical campus activities or campus engagement um, units. So the sort of attorney life unit Um, our leadership, our campus programming, all of those became one with our LGBTQ plus resource center and our formerly known as Center for Intercultural Engagement. So the impetus behind that was really so that we could actually make sure that diversity, equity, inclusion, and sense of belonging were included in everything that was happening on the traditional activity side of of campus, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, So what we've done for the past two years is built really, I think, a a strong foundation for this office that then makes sure that our uh, students of color see themselves more represented um, in the programs and the activities and things that are going on um, within the Division of Student Affairs. So that's one of the things I think is really helpful. And then obviously, definitely, if you go back, to um, this this past summer and the work that our black students and our uh, 
Latinx or Hispanic students worked together collaboratively along with some of our majority students as well mm -hmm. to bring about some of the changes that you're now beginning to see. For example, um, the hiring of a, a, a director of Black Student Initiatives out of um, the off that shares an office with um, with Jackie, but then also the Black Cultural Center, a space that is coming online soon. Um, all because our administrators sat down and listened to what our students had to say um, and took a lot of that into, into consideration to figure out how can we create the best space on campus and make sure that our students of color feel connected to the institution. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these things don't happen, you know, just like that or just mm -hmm. overnight. It does take a little bit of time. Um, but I think at least when I think back to where we were over the summer to where we are now, I definitely see a lot of great progress. Um, also knowing I'm a part of a work group. Um, I think Jackie and I are part of this work group that's putting together um, a student success initiative. And the goal behind that really the first year, that pilot year, is what can we do to make sure that our African-American students especially are feeling connected. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an initiative that was announced at the beginning of the semester. And we're well on our way into making some, some progress for what that pilot experience will be like for our Black students when they come in the fall. So definitely, definitely, there's not to say we're completely done, because there's always more work to do. Um, but I think we've got a, a good, solid foundation of where we're going to go from here. In their heart, they are, they are very supportive of these efforts. And so um, we've seen some of the movement and some of the changes um, in response to um, what students have been have been asking for. Um, and certainly for black students, that's that's been, you know, some of the biggest um, kind of moving the needle this year has has been around black student initiatives. But I think um, we should also, you know, keep in mind some of the other changes that have been happening. So our Native American Student Organization Association, excuse me, um, and others um, uh, from the tribal council and other other places have been um, put together a committee for changing the seal. Um, there's been a, a committee to create a land acknowledgement. And so there's been important changes, symbolic changes, but still really important changes that um, show our support for our indigenous students on campus. Um, also think about the mural. The mural project was something that I was very in intimately involved in. And um, I can tell you from the beginning, it had the support of the highest administration on campus. Um, and it's, it's become kind of, again, like the symbol for, um, you know, the, it tells a story. We have this narrative about what Marquette is and what a typical Marquette student looks like. And it challenges that narrative. And it says, you belong here too, to see yourself reflected in a very large way, you know, you can see yourself and your potential on that wall, really. Um, and so I think that there's been a lot of those kinds of changes as well that have been very, very supported by upper administration. Um, in terms of my, my office, our Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion, as Demetria mentioned, we are gaining um, another staff person. And we also gained Jacqueline Schramm, who moved over from the Office of Public Affairs. Um, into our office and she's a special assistant for Native American Affairs in, in addition to her work with public affairs. Um, and so our office is expanding, um, you know, in times of this very difficult financial um, period in Marquette's history, our budget and our plans have been protected. And so it's it's been, I think, really, really important to recognize that there have been um, steps taken by our leaders to show their support. And I know that, you know, nobody's perfect and we're all working, you know, kind of rowing in the same direction. We don't always um, agree on how to get to our destination, um, but I think it, it is important that they're open and they're listening and they're willing to move the needle forward. Um, one other thing I'll mention is that, yes, it's really, really important to have our leadership on board, but it also needs to be a bottom-up effort. Like it can't just be mandated from the top. It can't just be hierarchical top-down. It has to be baked into the cake, as, as Dr. Cole likes to say, diversity, equity, and inclusion is all of our jobs, you know, and we have these particular offices, Dante's and Demetria's and mine and others on campus that are specific to helping underrepresented and first gen and low income students. Um, but we all need to take responsibility for working with students and working with faculty and staff too, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we are all moving in the right direction towards our goals. Um, it's all our job.
there is support from the administration in regards of what me, a program like EOP means uh, to the legacy of the university. But I think um, with the efforts of um, you know student activists, uh, particularly those of the Black Student Council, um, you know I think um, you know their efforts and the energy in which they did it really forced us to look inward. And you know, you know, what does it, you know, what does EOP mean in 2021? And you know, really, you know, pushed us to not coast on the legacy of the program, but to actually make the program work for the students in the here and now. And we're fortunate that you, we have university funding to supplement uh, federal funding uh, to support our programs to keep things operating so that we can serve our students um, in the way they need to be served. But I think um, we need to reassess um, what the deliverables look like uh, for the future of our students and the lives they want to live. No, for sure. Definitely looking forward. And even Demetrius said it, this is not a day and night type thing. Um, so what is something that you hope to see the administration do to continue to promote different cultures and, bra and backgrounds? Jackie? Um, well, certainly, a you know, an initiative that's near and dear to my heart is our Hispanic Serving Institution Initiative. And this is something that I've been the steward of since its inception in 2016. Um, this is something that I think is really important for mobilizing the campus in a, in a much bigger way, um, even beyond just Latinx students um, to, to work towards our, our, you know, end goal of making Marquette a really welcoming place for everybody, for all of our diverse stakeholders. Um, students, faculty, and staff. And so one thing that you have to understand about Hispanic serving institutions is that they're extremely diverse. They haven't been created with a specific charter to serve a particular demographic group um, like HBCUs or tribal colleges, for example. Um, but they're one of a cluster of these minority serving institutions that grow into their designation by virtue of really just their geographic location in, in diversity rich areas. Um, and so they educate, you know, high percentages of not just, you know, two thirds of all Latinx undergrads in the country, but huge percentages of black students, indigenous students, Native and Pacific Islander students as well. So what we're trying to do accomplish with this initiative is to not just bring more diverse students to campus, but also to make sure that we're serving them well, you know, it's called Hispanic serving institutions. And so this is something that I, um, my hope is moving forward that this may um, remains a priority for our administration um, and that um, there is a, a real effort and a real push to um, provide you know financial backing to make sure that these that this initiative is successful yeah sure that's a great question um, I think there I'll say it this way one of the things that I talk with my team about is visibility and accessibility to students and what I mean by that is to make sure that the things that we're offering, the programs, activities, services, all of that, that our students um, get to know any one of our staff members. If they see me, they should expect to be able to see anyone else that, that is a part of the OEI team. Um, when I think about where we can go from here, what I really love to see, there's so much happening on our campus. My rule of thumb is if you're bored, you're doing something wrong, right? Because there's always something going on. What I'd like for us to um, do a, a stronger job at is pulling together places where students can go and find that information, right? So if Dante is hosting an ELP Lunch and Learn, there's no reason why we can't also uh, cross promote that and make sure that other students have the opportunity to learn and hear from the folks who are coming in to speak to the students in ELP. So again, while those programs and services exist, um, and I won't say that they exist in a vacuum, but they have a specific target population in mind, I wanna make it so that whatever we're doing out of the Office of Engagement and Inclusion or out of the center by the same name or the LGBTQ plus resource center, that more people know what's happening because that is again how a, we help to cultivate that sense of belonging, but B, that's how we help to educate on diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiatives. So just making sure that we are cross-sharing, cross cross-promoting the information that's out there so that everyone as a campus community has the opportunity to engage in those events. 
Uh, to build on what Demetria was saying about um, information sharing and uh, cross promoting, um, you know, I would just say overall, uh, just a stronger infrastructure uh, between offices, centers, and programs across campus. Um, there's no reason why um, EOP students, um, you know, can't know what um, CEI is doing, um, what Career Services Center is doing, uh, what Curto is doing, what the Center for Advancement Humanities is doing, so on and so forth. You get the point. And I think, um, you know, the reason why, um, you know, some of the hindrances for that is because, um, you know, it's easy for us to get, um, you know, so absorbed with trying to, um, you know, keep our own shops um, in place um, in terms of, make, of uh, you know, making sure that the resources aren't depleted um, in terms of making sure that we have, uh, you know, the minimal uh, resources available to the students and then also that we're, that our um, work schedules are manageable, uh, making sure the staff um, that we work with, that we uh, supervise, that they're, um, all of that is manageable. And I think that's what leads to, um, you know, to, uh, you know, various um, pockets of campus being siloed sometimes um, that, uh, you know, sometimes we get uh, so absorbed in the maintenance of things that um, we forget that, you know, we're actually, you know, doing some things that other people on campus need to know about. And, you know, sometimes I think it's, um, you know, it's not that difficult, um, you know, you know, we all interact with each other um, in different kinds of meetings and things like that. And, um, you know, something I could challenge myself to do is that, you know, if I'm leading a meeting that um, other parties on campus are um, taking part in, you know, I could at least lead the meeting by, or close the meeting by saying, asking, so, um, you know, what are some uh, things that you're doing on campus? What are some events? Uh, what are some initiatives that you have that you think other people need to know about? So I think, um, you know, collaboration, um, cross promotion, um, information sharing, resource sharing uh, to the capacity that we can. Um, and um, something I would else that I would like to see is, um, you know, just a stronger utilization of alumni. Um, you know, I know some people um, kind of keep distant from Marquette um, based on their experiences, but there are some who, you know, certainly want to give uh, back and um, make sure that um, a new generation of uh, Marquette students are able to have a more fulfilling experience. And if they can't do that with money, they at least want to do that with time and they at least want to do that in terms of um, accessing networks so that when they transition out of their undergraduate studies, you know, there's um, people that they uh, we can reach out to to make uh, you know, the, that transition and not feel isolated. That's the time that we have. Thank you all for, for being here to share your insights and for your support that you show and give students on campus. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for the opportunity. I want to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I need to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Why can't I eat, eat, eat apples and bananas? Support the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks to help provide meals to those in need. Join us at feedingamerica.org. Hey, Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Can birds draw pictures? I don't have an answer for that. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! Welcome back to Being the Difference, a town hall on diversity and inclusion. Now, the demand for diversity and inclusion has been prominent amongst people of color across the world for decades and arguably centuries. And when we say diversity, we do not just mean add more people of color into the mix. Because even though you mix eggs, flour, butter, vanilla, and sugar to bake a mean pound cake, if you have too many eggs or too much vanilla, 
you might not come out with a delicious result. What makes it all come together is the steady mixing and blending of the ingredients to make one solid bowl of batter. And then with applied heat, the batter rises and forms into a golden brown pound cake. Who knew a video of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and a picture of Brenna Taylor would stir together folks of different backgrounds about systemic racism across the world. And in the heat of late spring and throughout the summer, people rose, stood, lifted their voices and fists to the sky to demand for change. Now, don't get me wrong, there's been a lot of activism throughout history on this subject, of course. In recent times, the Black Lives Matter movement was initiated after the death of Trayvon Martin in 2013. But there wasn't a global pandemic that took away the distractions of our individual worlds. This time is different. And inclusion stems from the same place. Often the perception is if you throw in a person of color or a member of the LGBTQ plus community in the background, that's enough and the work is done. But inclusion is so much deeper than face value. Inclusion takes consistent effort and work to have a successful impact. If diversity is a pound cake, then inclusion is like a complex chain of dominoes. If even one part is missing from the group, then the entire chain will fail. However, when the effort is put in and carried through, it leads to a wonderful creation. Just like never ending consistent pieces linked together to create a beautiful piece of art. The joy of feeling seen, whether it's on a show or on a campus, should be felt by everyone always. And while we've made small steps towards change, they are exactly that, small. Until we create a space for all to be seen, the work isn't done. And this does not just come from administration, governors and presidents, or even just white people. Yes, this also includes you, my brothers and sisters of color. We too have some work to do. So here's a short list of how we can promote diversity and inclusion amongst ourselves. First off, let's speak some light and not have to fall back or settle for the stereotype. There's no such thing as acting black, talking white. Being raised in the suburbs or in the hood does not make someone more or less bright. Let's not subject ourselves to only being one way. Education is power, my sister and my brother. Even Jay-Z said, intelligence is not attributed to color. And for years now, they say that we developed a slave-like mentality. It's competition to get what's yours. Almost like a bucket full of crabs. Where instead, we should be the first to lift each other up. That should be our reality. And if we can't do it ourselves, we can't look to others to fully support us back. And what's up with people saying that you don't look a certain way? tell me about it you don't look hispanic you don't look black you don't look asian whatever it is we're adding it to the list and we can name all these things and there are certainly things that we have missed but let's leave you all with some inspiration and a story of perseverance once upon a time there was a girl of color growing up in an environment where not too many people looked like her and not too far from her was a boy and his older sister growing up in a similar white community, the suburbs. All throughout grade school, she felt like any other student, but for the other students, she was different. She wasn't like them. And the boy experienced the same. His passions for sports and music were ways that he showed his talents and then was bullied for how he looks and even talks. However, these two did not quit, could not quit, and still won't quit. And being told you're too short, you're too tall, too big, too pale, too dark, too white, too black, fueled their inspiration. And this inspiration allowed them to be accepted into a well-known university called Marquette. And that was and is only the beginning. Today, that little girl and little boy too is me, Alex Rivera Grant, the executive entertainment producer for MUTV and incoming general manager of MUTV, Andrew Amuzu. Hopefully this program inspired you and pushed yourself and others to be open to these conversations. And always remember, what you reveal is what you heal. So let's all heal together and strive in being the, the difference. difference.